We're so God is so good. He's so, um, he's amazing. He's so good to us and so loving. And um, I, I've been working on my testimony today and preparing it to share with you all. And it's, uh, it, it was so, uh, it, it just hit me w- w- with the songs. And, and uh, what I want to share with you today, uh, just how tenderhearted God has been with me. Um, with the world and so many things in life wanting to, to push me and, and be difficult in the challenges through life. Um, God has always been the one that's been just so tenderhearted <laughs> to me. And so um, I really recommend for each one of you to write out your own testimony. Maybe we could share it sometime, but write it out because... Sometimes you end up just seeing, like, wow, God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for who you have been in my life. And so I was just really blessed today getting to write this. And I really hope that today, after sharing this with you, that you guys also see, just see the goodness of God. Maybe you'll relate with, certain, with some parts, uh, maybe not with some other parts, but um, I hope that through this, you just see the goodness of God and that you're encouraged. And so uh, I'm just excited to be here with you guys. I'm happy to be here. Today is my first day fully here. Staff, Calvary Chapel, Jericho Road, pastor here. And so I've been looking forward to this, and I'm very, very happy. I'm looking forward to how the Lord is going to use us to be serving him and his people and being a light in this darkness. And this world needs Jesus. This world needs his peace. This world needs his joy. And I'm really excited for the impact Christ will make in this world, um, but with, also with our own lives and how God's going to use us. And so thank you for praying for me um, and, be pray- and, and Wolf, really for praying for your next pastor and taking that seriously. And, um, and please continue to pray as we continue to seek his will. Um, And so, anyways, I'm just blessed to be here, to be part of this church family here, and excited to grow closer to you and closer to the Lord. And so let's let's pray before we get into this. God, just be with us. We ask that you would bless this time, Lord, that you would be honored. God, that you would use this, Lord, for your glory. Lord, to work in in our hearts, Lord, that you would just bless us here, gathering who who made it here. So God, we just ask for your blessing here, and it's in your name we pray, amen, amen. So uh, what I hope that you get out of my testimony is that God calls us to himself and that he does the work. Uh, Despite my foolishness, despite my weaknesses, despite my failures, he called me, he saved me. He uses me, and I don't deserve his love or his grace, but he poured it out. And I hope that you're encouraged today and know that God has that same love and grace for you. Um, And so uh, I'll just get right into it. Uh, This is how God saved me and called me. Uh, I grew up with godly parents. Um, They actually visited here uh, a couple of Sundays ago and uh, grew up In the church, grew up at Calvary Chapel Corona as a toddler, so I grew up hearing about Jesus at Calvary Chapel. Um, When I was three years old, I wanted to be a firefighter, and that was my dream all the way through my entire childhood. It was always, I'm going to be a firefighter, and uh, that was all the way through, like pretty almost all the way to the end of high school. That was that was my focus in life. However, as a kid, I was very shy. Uh, I compared myself to others a lot. I was very insecure. I did not talk. If there was a school project where I had to do any public speaking, I chose to fail, and I left. I would just go to the bathroom, or I would just ditch school that day. I just would not actually show up to it, because I really did not want to public, and so now, yeah, look at me, right? <laughs> what God does, yeah, he has a sense of humor, I guess, but, you know, he uses our weaknesses, and I hope you see that um, through this, but I 
uh, compared myself with a lot of other people. And I just didn't feel like I was good enough. Like I was, believe it or not, too skinny for sports. And I wasn't smart enough. And so I felt like I had to be cool to fit in, to have like my place. So I, that was like my focus. And so in junior high and high school, I always wanted to fit in at being cool. And so um, I thought, oh, cool, kid, cool people have a lot of girlfriends. <laughs> and so um, that's what I tried to do. And so I'd have a girlfriend at church, a girlfriend at you know, school, a girlfriend online, as many girlfriends as I possibly could to just try to fit in. Uh, and that just didn't, you know, that wasn't the right thing. And I knew it. I felt it. It wasn't the right thing. It was ditching class and, and raving. I, the, when I was in high school, uh, the whole emo scene was new. And so I was caught up into all of that whole world and drumming. And I just kind of had a double life because, like I said, I grew up in the church, but I was hypocritical. You know, I, I knew how to act at church and how to fit in there. But I was living a double life from church and home. Um, I'd even bullied people. Um, I would torment the teachers, and I'd steal, like, the remotes and stuff. And uh, I'd put it in some kid that I didn't like's backpack and then watch that unfold. And um, here's a jacked up one that just makes me sick thinking of that. You know, I, I would find an insecure, insecure girl, um, and I'd flirt with her so that she would do my homework and help me cheat in class. And uh, I would give my mom gray hairs. <laughs> That's what she would say a lot. You're giving me gray hairs. She'd see some of these things that I do. And, and I hated my sin. Like, I felt guilty. I knew God wasn't happy with the way that I was living. And I was doing a lot of this kind of stuff, like acting out like that, and just wanting to be, to find my place and to be liked, and for people to think I'm cool. Because <laughs> I, I was, like I said, I, I just couldn't fit in anywhere else. And so that's what I tried to do. Um, that's how I tried to fit in. And I hated it. I felt guilty. I, uh, but I just kept living in sin. Um, this was all through, like, junior high and high school. Um, I even got into drumming, and, and everyone thinks drummers are cool. So I got into drumming because I wanted to be cool uh, for attention. But each summer, I'm so thankful for this, my dad would force me to go on these missionary trips to Honduras. And we'd go there for a week. And it would help me see my need for Jesus. I'd see poverty and I'd see their joy and it'd touch my heart. But I would default back into sin. And I, and I knew it was wrong. And so I would think, like, man, I'm just not good at anything. <laughs> I'm not a good sinner because I hate myself for it. Like, I'd, I'd feel depressed. I'd feel, I would just feel terrible. I was like, so I'm not a good, I'm not even a good sinner. Um, and I'm not even good at being a Christian um, because I'm a hypocrite trying to act spiritual and godly. So I'm like, I'm just not good at any of it. Um, and so towards the end of my time in high school while drumming at home, um, I was playing along to some worship music. And I had a moment that felt so real to me. And, I, I, and while I was playing, it was like God just spoke to me, you're mine. And it felt so real. And I started crying. And accidentally... <laughs> The worship pastor to Calvary Chapel Corona calls me. He didn't mean to call me. He meant to call another Nathan that plays the drums at the church. He barely knew I knew how to play. And he said, oh, well, since I have you on the line, can you play on, can you play on church on Wednesday? And that's when I made Jesus my Savior. Um, I asked God to forgive me. I saw that he reached out for me, that he called me, and that he wanted to forgive me of my sins and that, that guilt that was just in my heart for the way I was living. It was oh, the weight lifted off and I felt free. <laughs> I felt forgiven. 
uh, but I didn't really make Jesus the Lord of my life yet. That hadn't happened yet. Um, so I graduated high school, and the day after I graduate high school, my dad lost his job. And then my family faced a really big hardship. And I knew the only way I could help them was to point them to Jesus because there was nothing I could say or do. And what happened was is something that's still in effect to, to, to this day. I saw the word of God transform lives. I saw the power of God using his word to practically do something impossible in the life of people that I love. And then I go on another missions trip to Honduras again. And I come back, you know, when I was on that missions trip, I saw, I saw there was a miracle that took place. There was, but what blew my mind the most was we were in this place called The Dump, which is bad because Honduras is already a really poor country. So when it's a place called The Dump, it's really bad. And so we were in this place called, that they called The Dump. And it was really bad. There was a lot of poverty there. And we were going in there thinking we're going to bless these people. And we brought sandals to put on their feet, candy. And I was in charge of the VBS Thing, and so I was going to help with that, and I was really excited about it. And then um, what really got me is we had a church service after we had this full day of activities and helping them. They come to church, and I saw so much joy. And I saw that they have something I do not have. They had this peace of God. They had this joy of the Lord. So I come back home, and my mind is just like, what is this? I have not seen so much joy. I have not seen so much peace. And it's from these people. Like, okay, there's something real about this. I've seen the word of God work powerfully in my family's life. I'm seeing joy and peace happening in these people that it shouldn't seem like they have this. And conveniently, I end up reading the book of Ecclesiastes. I was like, I'm just going to open up God's word, and God... I did one of those, you know, they call it Bible roulette, you know, and you just flip to a random spot, and that's what I did. And I just opened my Bible to a random spot. It was the book of Ecclesiastes that just talks about how apart from God, life is vanity. It's meaningless. It's chasing the wind. It just, without God, it's just there's, there's nothing. You just die, you know? Whatever it is, it just, it just passes away. And I'm like, I was living for all these things. I was living for the attention of others, and I was living for the being liked by people and the things of this world. And so, after reading the book of Ecclesiastes, I just said, God, what do you want me to do? And I felt like God gave me this option. <laughs> like, you could be a firefighter. Or you can do what I'm calling you to do and save people from hell, the fires of hell. So I wrote down in my journal that night, I said, God, what do you want me to do? And I'll do it. What's your call for me? What do you want me to do? And at this point, me and Megan weren't even dating, but I had a dream that Megan stands up from this couch and she just says, Nate, you're going to be a pastor. <laughs> And I woke up, and I was like, that's it. That's my call. I'm going to be a pastor. And I shocked my mom, who, remember, knows me as this. This is all, by the way, it's like sudden, like within like maybe a week's time or two weeks' time. I went from crazy high school me, how I was, to just out of nowhere, like, I'm going to be a pastor. <laughs> my mom was like, what? All right. No way, you know, and my dad was like, right on, let's do this. And right off the bat, um, I, I get in my car, um, I was headed to, uh, to a, 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 um, uh, an event at the church, and 
on the radio, it says, if you're called into ministry, don't worry, God will provide for you, God will take care of you. Um, and all of a sudden, these confirmations started popping up, and there was an advertisement to go to Calvary Chapel Bible College. And so I would go there, and I, I felt called to go there um, and to prepare for that call. And I started seeing these verses, uh, this verse in particular, 2 Timothy 2.15, just kept coming up, and I was like, kept seeing it everywhere. I went, all right, God's calling me to go to Bible college, but I only had enough money for one semester, but I felt like God was telling me, take a step of faith and just go for it, and so as I was just seeing that verse all over the place, so by the way, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. On that verse, people would be praying over me. I'd see it on, like, some shirts. It'd be on, like, the TV or something. It was just, like, it seemed like everywhere I looked, that verse just kept popping up. And while I took that step of faith to go there, Megan went to school of worship. And my other three semesters uh, were provided for without me ever asking from three different places. And one of them, I still have no idea where it came from. I was just told, God paid for you. So I took my time at Bible college seriously because I really felt that God called me to go there and provided for me to be there. And so if it was possible, I spent 12 hours each day in the library, and that's where I met Brian Delmore. <laughs> that's where I met him, and me and him were library buddies. And in the breaks uh, of being there in between the semesters, I would volunteer at my home church, serving however I could. When I graduated, everyone knew what they were doing after they graduated. They were like, I'm interning here, I'm interning here, I'm going to be a pastor here, I'm going to be a pastor there. And I just didn't feel like I needed to look. I was like, God has led me each step of where I need to go. All I know is that God has called for all of us, is God called for me to preach the gospel So after I graduated, I just packed up my backpack full of Bibles, and I started going door to door, preaching the gospel. And I did that for about a week, and then uh, my senior pastor at Corona, he called me and said, hey, let's go to Chili's. And uh, that's where he hired me. (laughs) Uh, Basically, the goal was to intern me turned me into a Swiss army knife, kind of, and that knew how to basically do everything throughout the church. Uh, learn how to do everything, help oversee the children's ministry. Uh, eventually, when I was working there, doing all this stuff, uh, I, took, uh, I started a Bible college that was there, and so that was running for a while and doing pretty well. Then I took over high school ministry when, um, when that need developed, and I had been doing that, and that has been... That was awesome. (laughs) Um, I really had a heart for the kids who felt out of place. I'd recognize that with them. And I learned a lot in those 10 years of ministry. But four years ago, we had our firstborn son, Nehemiah. And our life flipped when when, when he was born, which normally just happens with any firstborn child, but when Nehemiah was five weeks old, he started having seizures, and when we went to the hospital, they told us, when they gave us his diagnosis, they told us he may not ever walk or talk. They told us that he may not even be able to swallow his own, his own food. They told us that Uh, My biggest concern was, will my son be able to have friends? And uh, they told us uh, they don't know. And our world flipped upside down. Everything seemed to be going strong and well, and that happened. And it caused us to really rely on the Lord and showed us that we can't control our circumstances And so God showed us that he's the one that's in control and that he hears prayers. And so we would rejoice and thank God for every single milestone that Nehemiah would hit. And while he's still on seizure meds today, and that's why we have to be very careful with him, 
we have to trust that his life is in God's hands. And we thank God for every single miracle. Every time he talks, every time he says something, when he walks, we're like, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you for this miracle. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Then during, so then just after that, this time that seems probably familiar to you, happened, COVID. So we, we kind of had a whole year of being um, in quarantine with Nehemiah, then 2020 hit, and we were in quarantine with the rest of the world. And we learned how to do online church, and then our second-born son uh, was born during COVID, which was a tough time, but knowing how God had carry us through Nehemiah, uh, COVID with Judah wasn't so bad. Then in October 3rd of 2021, uh, our third son, Hezekiah, went to heaven, and again, our world flipped upside down. And there's a whole lot to say about that, but I will say that God used it in major ways. In my life, it reminds me to rise up in God's strength and do his call. Because it's easy to cower down and be like, woe is me. But because this life is short, heaven isn't here, There's a mission to do. There's a call that God has for us. So in his strength, which by the way, Hezekiah means God's strength, but in his strength, rise up and do his call. And at that time, the call I strongly felt was to help people, especially dads with infant loss, but really it didn't matter what the issue was. I just felt like this deep burden in my heart to show God's love to hurting people. And it was working in my heart, and God was sending us parents who had lost their babies to minister to. But then my best friend spoke what I think was a a prophecy. And he said that it sounds like God is telling you to start a ministry, to start Hezekiah's ministry, And he isn't going to tell you what's next till you start. And there's a whole lot more to that. But basically, he just said, um, start Hezekiah's ministry, and God will tell you what to do next. And uh, which is basically to spoil the whole story, it's you. (laughs) Um, So I took this time off to, uh, to start this ministry for, it was about a whole month, and worked on it, and when I published it all and we got it all out there, it was near the time of our anniversary, and I was like, all right, we need to decompress this weekend and just spend time together. And so we went to this pretty cool city called San Diego, <laughs> and we actually ended up 10 minutes away from here. We were at a really good barbecue place, which we should all go to sometime. Then we got home on Saturday night, And one of the first dads that I had been helping, he had been going, he was really angry after his loss. He was violent. He punched his boss in the face. uh, But I got to help him, and I saw God work in his life, and he had become this, he loves the Lord. He loves his family. And so he sends me a text on Saturday. He says, could you baptize me on Sunday? (laughs) And I was still on vacation, so I was like, where are we going? Like, where's this at? Let's do this. Let me, but first, let me ask your pastor up there. And he was from another Calvary Chapel, up, uh, like near Big Bear. And so I thought, hey, what a perfect way to end uh, this vacation, having you know, just finished Hezekiah's ministry, just got it done. Uh, what a perfect way to end all of this with getting to baptize one of these dads. And... I was looking forward to that, and so when I got to do that, the entire time, though, I'm thinking, all right, like, this time is closing. God, what's next? What do you want to do next? What's, what's happening? What do you want to do after this? And so um, I baptized him that next day, and I knew, all right, well, I'm going to be going back to work on Monday. We get home. It was like, it was Sunday night. I'm like, God, what do you want to do next? What's happening? Do I just kind of keep this going? I just kind of felt like there was a sense of 
I completed the task you wanted me to do, God. What is it? I just really thought there's something. And it was that exact night that I hear, I click on one of my friend's posts. Her name's Gia. Probably heard of her too. And she posted about Calvary Chapel Jericho Road looking for a pastor. And, and it hit me. And I thought, well, maybe this is the right thing. And so, or this is the next thing. And so I talked to my senior pastor about it. And he expressed how he doesn't want me to go, but he wants me to do God's call. But what really got me is his wife, Terry, which is unlike her (laughs) to want to say something like this, but she did. Um, And when she hears from the Lord, it's like, listen. (laughs) And she said that she felt like the Lord told her, Nate needs to reach out to Calvary Chapel Jericho Road. And so I did. And I prayed a bunch And then all of a sudden, these confirmations started coming in. And then I started to like you people. (laughs) And now I have a a notes list full of these just different confirmations and things that the Lord has shown me. And I'm sure I'll share with them more and more with you. But so did the moment all of a sudden took place where it was time to take a step of faith. To leave your homeland. (laughs) my security, my family, my friends, my opportunities to follow God's call to be here. And so that's why I'm excited to be here with you guys because God led me here, um, which I know is for a reason. And I'm really excited to discover what that reason is. But that is how God saved me. That's how he called me and used the challenges throughout life, like I said, how I just have been pushed around, it seems like, through life, and, um, but God has always been tenderhearted to me, and he has always been so good to me. Uh, one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. that says, but God has cho- chosen the foolish things of the world to put shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put shame the things which are mighty, and that God isn't looking for uh, perfect people, and actually, I will have Dustin come on up, and close us out with some worship. But God isn't looking for perfect people, but He's looking for willing people. People who are just willing to be used by Him. And so, but first, if you haven't placed your trust in Jesus to be your Savior, you can right now, and you should. Sin makes you guilty, Jesus sets you free. And I'm so thankful for Jesus for saving me and for calling me and getting to follow his path that he has for me. I know if I would have went the path that I thought my life should have went, I would have been a mess. But because of Jesus, he's done some great things. He's got to use me in in, in ways I never would have imagined. And he does the work, and he does it. And so I hope for all of us that we get to experience that. And just continue to follow him. But God is good. Amen? Amen? Let me, let me pray. God, thank you for your goodness. God, thank you for your love and being so good to us and kind to us. God, I just pray for us here today. Lord, that you would just work in our hearts. God, if there's anybody who's here that needs to know you to be your Savior, I pray that they would place their trust in you, knowing that what you did on the cross and the resurrection is enough. But also, if there's anybody who's here and they haven't surrendered their life to you and they've been holding on to some aspects, God, that they would just give it up, that they would follow after you and do what you called for them to do. God, your your grace is amazing. We do not deserve it. We don't deserve your love. But God, you want to use us. Thank you, God. Please use us, God. Give this church your Holy Spirit, your love and your joy and your peace that we would be rejoicing like those people in Honduras in love with you, celebrating you, God, thankful for you. Please work in our hearts, God. Fill this place with your spirit, God. As we close out with this last song, God, continue to work in our hearts.
It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.